Well, good evening, everyone. I see people are just getting uh, joining us this evening. And so I'll, I'll give everybody a chance to kind of get signed on and logged on. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Sourcebooks Booklight event. And thrilled to be back here with our fall series, um, kicking off tonight with some amazing authors. My name is Mary Weber O'Malley and I'm honored to be your host for this evening. I'm a virtual bookseller for Skylark Bookshop and you can find me talking books on Instagram and Facebook at Blurb Your Enthusiasm. Tonight to kick us off for Booklight events, we have three absolutely amazing authors all with books about lesser known aspects of World War II historical fiction. Before we get started this evening, I would like to remind you that we would like you to support our indie bookstores. And when you do so, when you order any of the author's books from any of the stores listed on Eventbrite, you will receive a signed book plate as well as some amazing swag. So check out those stores on Eventbrite and make sure you order your books from them. We love our indie bookstores. As we move through our program, please put any questions you have for the authors into the Q&A, and we will get to those after the authors interview each other. And tonight, for the first time, we have another fun little something. We have a raffle for all of our attendees. So if you are here watching this evening, keep an eye in the chat for a, uh, a link to Rafflecopter. And one winner at the end of the event will announce you will receive a finished copy of each of the participating author's newest releases, The Ways We Hide, Cradles of the Reich, and When Franny Stands Up, a signed copy of Sold on a Monday by Christina McMorris, all packaged in a special edition box inspired by The Ways We Hide. So an, attendees will find that link for Rafflecopter Go ahead and follow that to enter the raffle and I'll announce the winner when we're through with the Q&A. So tonight I'm so pleased to introduce Jennifer Coburn, who is the author of Cradles of the Reich. She has also published a mother-daughter travel memoir, Will Always Have Paris, as well as six contemporary women's novels. Additionally, Jennifer has contributed to five literary anthologies, including A Paris All Your Own. Jennifer lives in San Diego with her husband, William. Their daughter, Katie, is currently in graduate school. When Jennifer is not going down historical research rabbit holes, she volunteers with So Say We All, a live storytelling organization where she's a performer, producer, and performance coach. She's also an active volunteer with Reality Changers, a nonprofit that supports low-income high school students in becoming the first in their families to attend college. She specializes in college essay development and interview prep. Jennifer, can you please tell us a little about your book? Hi, thanks, Mary. I have to say it's so nice to see your face and hear your voice. We usually communicate on Instagram. So it's a pleasure to be here and thanks everybody for tuning in. So Cradles of the Reich is a historical novel about three very different German women who meet at a top secret Lebensborn breeding program, which was the Nazis plan to create 2 million pure blooded Aryan babies for their so-called master race. And the program did this in three ways. The Nazis arranged sexual liaisons between German women and SS officers. They created maternity homes, mostly for unwed pregnant German women. And when the war began in 1939, the Nazis kidnapped blonde hair, blue eyed children from countries they invaded. In the end, the Lebensborn program created 20,000 babies and kidnapped 200,000 children. The three women in Cradles of the Reich represent different faces of Gentile Germany, Gundi the resistor, Hilda the true believer, and Irma the bystander. The women each have different needs and desires and are often at odds with one another. And as a result, they change each other's lives, sometimes for the better and sometimes for the disastrous. 
We can't wait to hear more about this during your interview. Um, just absolutely fascinating novel. All right, so now we have Eden Robbins, who's the author of debut novel, When Franny Stands Up, a unique and endearing novel coming your way November 1st from Sourcebooks Landmark. She also writes short stories and essays and cultural criticism and co-hosts a podcast about boring science with a marine biologist. She enjoys making difficult things funny and funny things difficult. Although Eden has traveled to the bottom of the ocean, you cannot make her go to space. She manages anxiety in her life through bird watching and drastic haircuts. Eden, would you please tell us about your book? Uh, I will. Hi, Mary. It's nice to see you. It's nice to be here. Um, my book, When Franny Stands Up, is a queer, marvelous Mrs. Maisel where the jokes are magic. Um, I also like to call it my funny book about trauma. And there's way more to it, but I'm just going to stop there for now. Excellent. Again, another fascinating uh little known bit of World War II historical fiction that we'll learn more about as we go on this evening. Next, we have Christina McMorris, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and USA Today bestselling author of two novellas and seven historical novels, including the million copy bestseller Sold on a Monday, and her fall releases The Ways We Hide and the collaborative When We Had Wings. The recipient of more than 20 national literary awards, she previously hosted weekly TV shows for Warner Brothers and an ABC affiliate, beginning at age nine with an Emmy award-winning program, and owned a wedding and event planning company until she had far surpassed her limit of YMCA and chicken dances. She lives near Portland, Oregon, where she is the proud mom of two teenage going on 40 boys who keep her on the run, run and make her laugh daily. Christina, please tell us about your book. Hi, thank you. And thanks for having us. I'm super excited to tell you about the book because today is pub day. So it's out into the world and fingers crossed that, um, that readers will enjoy it. And thank you to all the indie stores and the booksellers. Oh my goodness. You mean you, you do not sell a million books um, by yourself, because I do not have that many family and friends. <laughs> so the only way that happens is with you guys. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's see. So The Ways We Hide. In short, it is about a female illusionist in 1942 who is the mastermind behind an escape show. The reason she's so good at escape traces back to a childhood trauma she survived in Michigan's Copper Country. That is a story I stumbled across and inspired the book and I was stunned I hadn't heard of it before. So because of her skill set, she is recruited by MI9. And if you've heard of MI5 and 6 and not 9, there's a good reason. They were British military intelligence, a very highly classified, very specialized group. And they were what I call the go-go gadget team of World War II. So they even had real historical figures that inspired Q from the James Bond film series. And so they created escape and evasion devices that they smuggled into almost anything you can think of. And I'm sure we'll touch on that later. But in short, my character gets pulled much deeper into the war than she ever expects because of working with MI9. So that's kind of it. And I can't wait to share it. Fantastic. I see greetings from all over the country pouring into the chat. Um, loving to see everybody here and from so many different places. Um, so now we come to the fun part. We are going to start with the authors interviewing each other, kind of like a dinner party. And then when the interviews are finished, we'll come back and I will be asking your questions. So please, if you do have a question, don't put it into the chat, put it into the Q&A so I can see it after the interview portion. And we are going to get started with that right now with Jennifer and Christina. And we'll see you back here afterwards. That's good. Thanks so much. Hi, Jen. I'm going to have to read your lips. <laughs> I'm not that good at spying. All right. Am I, am I there? Yeah. Am I unmuted? You yes. are. You are. So, congratulations on your publication day. Thank you. I have to 
say I read the book and it was phenomenal, just riveting. It had me on the edge of my seat. And what, what really struck me was how many different area, how many different specialties and how many different periods of time you needed to research. It was almost like writing three books. You had um, the Italian Hall disaster in Michigan. You had Fenna's, um, it, it, during Fenna's childhood, you had the Dutch resistance and the M19 gadgetry and illusions and then Fenna's life as an illusionist. I wanted to ask if there was any area of your research that you that came more easily to you or was more difficult for you because of your own personal background. Yeah. So, oh my goodness. Yes, you nailed it. There was enough research for three books. <laughs> so um, I did not know that going into it. And I was very naive to think, oh, I'll just order like 10 books. And that, that was the start that was, you know, so um, it was the gateway <laughs> to what became a huge pile of research, but I am so proud of this book for the research, for the complexity of the story. Mm -hmm. And as far as research goes, I want to say the, the easiest was probably the fact that I'd written uh, books that were set during World War II before. So dialogue and, you know, settings in the U.S. anyway, and some in Europe I was familiar with. Uh, the hardest part it's pretty much everything else. <laughs> so the the research they had to do with the Netherlands during World War II was something I was completely unfamiliar with. And of course, what's great is, you know, they say you're supposed to, they used to say, write what you know. And then I had heard, you know, I think it was Jody Pico who said, write what you want to learn about. And I think that's fantastic advice. I definitely didn't know anything and I, I've learned a ton since then. So Dutch resistance, um, how the Netherlands handled World War II was completely, was something I was wasn't familiar with because we often hear about the French resistance and um, and a lot of the other countries in Europe, and rarely do we hear about the Netherlands. So about how the Dutch were sort of viewed by Hitler, and you'll relate to this um, as their Aryan cousins. So he really thought that he could win them over without a, a, really a heavy hand throughout World War II, aside from the initial invasion. And that didn't go exactly how he how he planned, of course. Um, so I would say the Netherlands, Dutch resistance, and then also the languages was a big challenge because there was Hungarian, English that I do my best with. Um, there was also Dutch and German, but you have Dutch and German speakers who speak the other language as a second language. So, and also time period wise. So being able to talk to uh, Dutch people, German people and try to hopefully get it right. And I will say the magic part though, was the fun part. So being able to do that, I will say on a side note, I'll end on a happy note. That was actually the fun part too. Yeah, it seemed like you really had a good time with that. And also the gadgetry. I was reading it and I thought, is Christina an engineer? I mean, how did you, I I don't know. I, I think I would have started writing a book like that and just given up as soon as the first gadget uh, was introduced. How did you, how did you find out about all of that? So a lot of research, um, talking to magicians too. So I had professional magicians read through those parts of the book. I had probably about 20 experts read different parts of the book just to make sure hopefully that I got it right. And that was that. those were some of them, which was amazing to get their feedback. So I read a, a lot of Houdini books, um, a lot of his tricks that are published, thank goodness. And, and then things that happened that went right and wrong back then too. So that was really helpful. But you're right, when it came to describing certain tricks and some of them, you know, I. I created myself. So you kind of hope thinking, I think that you could pull this off. This sounds like plausible. Um, but the challenge of that, of course, is how you describe the mechanics of a magic trick that are visual and also isn't just super boring, you know, technical for somebody who is not entrenched in it. So that was really interesting. It reminded me, do you remember like when at kids parties that we'd play games? You remember, and I remember there was this always game that they'd say you pair up with someone, right? And they would have a picture and they would tell you what to draw without saying what it was. It was like, draw a circle, now do a line. And, and then of course it ends up crazy. And, um, and so that's what it reminded me of. It's like, how do you describe something visual on paper that way? Yeah, uh, that, well, it was really, really well done. It never, you understood it thoroughly and it never um, dragged on in the, in the description. But I really loved as much as the book, I really appreciated your author's note. It was so thorough and discussed exactly, um, you know, what you did in the research. And what struck me 
is uh, when you said that the idea came to you over the course of many years and in a flash. And I just would love for you to share that with, with the, um, the audience tonight. Sure, absolutely. So how it came to me was I have a file folder, I don't know about you, but file folder of ideas, tidbits that you come across that you think, that's so cool. How did I not know this? Maybe that could be a novel. And then you think it's not an entire novel. It's, an, it's not enough or it's too sad or whatever. And so I put it in the file folder. And what happened was after every book, I always think I'm out of ideas completely. I will never think of anything else again. Okay. If my editor's watching this, Shana, ignore this part. <laughs> I will always have ideas forever and ever and ever. Um, so I opened the file folder and there was a photo that was documenting the Italian hall disaster that we just talked about um, and was incredibly sad and was so striking that I thought, how did I not hear about this before? You know, this Christmas Eve tragedy that happened in Copper Country. And then next to it was an article that was about World War II and about how Monopoly had helped the allies win World War II. And you think, Monopoly, how does that, how did that contribute to the war effort. And I'd read it once before, but again, thought it was a fascinating fun fact, but couldn't, couldn't kind of populate an entire novel on its own. And what I found out was in Monopoly boards, you know, they would put two files, a compass and a silk map that wouldn't rustle when you crinkled it, of course, when you were in hiding. And they would put those in these pastimes like Monopoly and send them into POW camps as pastimes and then help the allies escape. And so, I thought when I suddenly when I put the two together and I recently compared this to Working Girl, that's how I think of it. Do you remember the movie Working Girl? Yeah, yeah. Where she was like, Trask, radio, Trask, radio, you know, and that's how it came to me. I'm like, oh my gosh, this, the Italian Hall disaster would be my character's backstory. She, she becomes a survivor of that tragedy. And as a result is obsessed with escape and Houdini and always needs two ways out of any room. And that she would be a natural to be recruited by MI9, who created the Monopoly boards and devices because they actually did recruit illusionists. Yeah, you know what I love what you're doing on social media, Christina, is I love how you're putting the uh, the gadgets and the illusions on social media so we can see them. I think you put a compass on this morning. A yeah, pen. yeah, it's a pencil clip. It's yeah. magnetized and it spins on the pencil. And I did set this aside just in case you wanna see it for people that haven't seen it, but yeah. Either come see me on tour. Um, I'm hitting 15 states, which is all kinds of insane, but fun. And um, and I'll bring them with me, but also on my social media pages as well. But here's one of the things that I show on there. And that is regular looking card, soak it in water. And an illusionist came up with this for MI9. And you split it apart and it becomes 52 cards that split in half to form an entire map of the area. So this is just some of the ingenious stuff they came up with. Brilliant, brilliant. So um, I know you've been getting great reviews. Um, Library Reads picked you as a top pick and you got a starred review on book list, as did Eden. So congratulations to Eden as well. Um, I wanna know, do you look at reviews like Goodreads reviews and Amazon reviews? Do you read them? And if, well, let me just ask you that question first. Do you read them? We should never read our reviews, but of course we read our reviews. <laughs> I'm, I'm in awe of authors who resist. That's like amazing to me. That's a superpower I do not have, but but it's, it's amazing to see how a story is, is read on the other side. Yeah, it's, it's a discipline I don't possess either. So um, I am curious, when you read your reviews, what are some of the ones that really gratify you, that make you really feel like, yes, this is why I did it? What's the best feedback you've gotten? Um, some of the ones, well, of course, we don't. We, we all love it when someone is swept away by a story, when they feel like they got to know the characters so much, they felt like they were walking away from a friend when they closed the book. I think that's one of my, my favorite comments that, you know, that we can ever receive. Um, also, which I especially love as historical fiction author is that they learned something from it, that they were amazed how much, like you said in my author's note, I really go into detail of how much was fact and fiction. There's so many facts that are just stranger than fiction, you know, that are woven through my story. And it's it's so gratifying then when they read that and and um, explain that, you know, encourage people, you've got to read the author's note. There's so much information I learned and now I want to go research it on my own, mm -hmm. which I think they take that as a huge compliment. And of course, if they just enjoyed the story, my gosh, that's just, that's fun. And you also uh, provided a resource list for people who want to do further reading as well. 
Yeah, that absolutely. Cool. Yeah. And documentary links. Uh, I've got a book club guide on the website that for the ways we hide and as, as well as sold on a Monday, but ways behind in particular has, you know, themed playlists and documentary links and, and those videos that we talked about of the demonstrations, but also further reading. So not only just books, but articles, which are so nice if you don't have a lot of time to read entire you know, uh, nonfiction stack about MI9, um, then at least you can read some articles that I found fascinating in my research. Wonderful. Um, so was The Ways We Hide your original title? I know a lot of times novels start with a different title and, and uh, end up with something else. Was this what, what you started with? And if not, what was it? I think it was about our 300th title. <laughs> I'm just estimating roughly. Um, no, it was, a, I think the working title that I sold it as knowing that it was not the right title, but it was close enough, um, was a thousand words. Um, sorry. Oh my gosh. I just had a little glitch because I was just writing that essay this morning about sold on a Monday. Sorry, switch. But yes, um, the, the ways we hide had way more choices, um, to pick from than sold on a Monday actually. And, I don't remember. I think for that forever, actually, on the manuscript, it was called Untitled Monopoly Book. Uh, and, and and that stayed and that drove me crazy, you know, but every day I'd stare at it like, we got to come up with something. Um, but my editor and I, like we and my agent, we brainstormed, brainstormed. We, we went through so many titles. And finally, um, when I hit on The Ways We Hide and my kids voted and said, that's the one. Um, and I was shocked it didn't already exist. I mean, it's one of those ones that seems like it would already exist and you, you know, Google it and it's not there and you think that's crazy. So, and it me has so many meanings to the story, as you know. And a thousand words was the original title of Sold on a Monday. It was, it was yeah. because the picture's worth a thousand words. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, another, yeah. another great book. That was, if you haven't read that yet, when you go out to get Christina's uh, new book, grab a copy of Soul on a Monday as well. Um, so when we as authors write our books, we often have something that we're really hoping to, that, that readers take away from the story. Um, what, what do you hope that your readers take away? I mean, other than having a great entertaining wonderful journey. What do you, is there a message that you want people to receive from this book? Aside from buying like a hundred copies for all their family and friends, <laughs> all three of us, by the way, all three of us. Um, yeah, I'll wrap mine up here really quick and step out and because I cannot wait to hear Eden chat as well, but I will say that um, probably going through World War II or Great Depression, all the time periods, same as you that, that we write about is finding hope through the darkest of times. And I think that really resonates today, you know, as you kind of go through hard, difficult times like a pandemic, um, that you find hope and feel stronger, hopefully, by the on, on the other side. So that's my okay. Okay. Well, okay. I, I wish you great success with this book or continued success. I mean, your your uh, your 15 state tour sounds amazing. I hope I hope many, many people come and visit you and um, and uh, read this wonderful book. Thank you, Jen. All right, I'll be circling back. So I will step out for the moment. So have fun. Okay. Bye-bye. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Eden. How are you? Oh, I'm so good. I Sorry to pop up early. I'm just so jazzed to interview you. Oh. Um, I blew through this book, The Cradles of the Reich, and it sounds kind of weird to be like, oh my God, it was just such a smooth, wonderful read about this horrific moment in history, but it really was like, it was like such an enjoyable experience to read it. And so thank you for writing this book. And I know that people are just going to love it. Thank you. Um, my first question. So one of the things I loved so much about this is that, so you, as you said, it's the sort of intertwining stories of three women in, uh, in Germany during World War II who are sort of experiencing um, this, this life, this strange moment in history in very different ways. All the characters, wonderfully complex, so specific and wonderful. They defy easy categorization. Um, Hilda, was tough. She was a tough read because she's this believer, right? Like she is, I was amazed at how you didn't flinch from making her fascism 
so believable. Like you just went all in on this. And I was also amazed and extremely uncomfortable <laughs> about the fact that I was rooting for her by the end, given everything that she had done. So how did you go about writing these characters? And specifically, I'm interested in how did you go about writing such a difficult character like Hilda? Well, I'm so glad you liked Hilda and not liked Hilda, but but were curious enough to continue with her because I was I was deeply uncomfortable writing a Nazi character. I'm a Jewish woman whose family, uh, my father's side of the family is Jewish, and I grew up with a terrible fear of Nazis and the Holocaust and the, and the uh, a resurrection of the Third Reich here in America. So it was a tough character to tackle. But before I get into that, I want to go to tell you a little bit about the other two so you can kind of see where they fit with each other. Um, I wanted to tell the story of the Lebensborn breeding program, and I wanted to do it through the lens of three different women who were in different positions within the Reich. I have Gundi, she's a university student, and she's part of the Nazi resistance. And, resistance. and she is secretly pregnant with her Jewish boyfriend's baby. And she was a pleasure to write. I love this strong female character who found herself, found her voice, found her heroism. She's amazing. Um, Thank you, thank you. And Irma, uh, she's a nurse who is just trying to keep her head down, like a lot of Germans were during that time. She's a bystander. And when she starts working at the Lebensborn maternity home, she feels really good about serving the Reich. She, she thinks she's doing a, a virtuous thing for these young women until she finds out the truth about the program and the Nazis, and she has to choose sides and then Hilda. She is what the Nazis called a real Hitler girl. She is loyal through and through to the Reich and she is really excited about being pregnant with a Nazi officer's baby. She was a hard character to write because of her anti-Semitism and because I'm Jewish. Um, but yeah, it was hard to write a character and, and see the world through the lens of somebody who thinks that, that um, the country would be better off without you and your family in it. So the work for me came in trying to create a highly flawed, highly damaged soul whose choices you hate. But I wanted readers to see her as pathetic rather than completely detestable. And the reason for that is if I wrote Hildy as a one-dimensional, evil character, it's easy for us to read this and think of her as one of those people over there from a long time ago. And what I really wanted to explore in this book was how the rise of fascism can happen almost anywhere. And I wanted to talk about what the red flags are and how a person and how a whole society can be seduced by a madman and and um, transformed into a nationwide cult of hate. So every time I started to write Hilda's point of view, I tried to ask myself, instead of what is wrong with this woman, which was my first go-to, what's wrong with her? I tried to say, what happened to Hilda? What happened to her to make her behave so terribly? Not to excuse her involvement with the Nazi party and not to justify any of her actions, but to dig a little deeper and to see um, how does this happen to people. So that's um, that's how I tackled Hilda. I think you did a terrific job of it <clears throat> because I think it would have been very easy and cathartic to to write her as evil, and it's much more uncomfortable to relate to her. You know. Um, so that was that was incredible. So the other thing that really struck me about this book so much is the it's such a vivid world. The details are so well drawn, so well researched, but like they never detract from the flow of the story. You know, the story just flows and it, the, the details just add a richness um, that is absorbing. Um, do you have favorite parts of the research that you did that you would want to share with us? You know, what I really enjoyed were uh, discovering the cultural details, even the most mundane cultural details of German life in 1939. 
when I took on this project, I knew I was going to have to research the non-aggression pact between Germany and Russia, the Battle of the Bazura, and when Germany invaded different countries. But what I had no idea what I was that I was in for, and what came up on every page were these little details like when a man puts on a pair of pants, does he zip the fly, button, or snap? So um, that was many, many hours of research and, and fascinating. Um, I met a gentleman in my community who was a seven-year-old boy living in Berlin during the time of Kristallnacht, 1938, the, the pogroms that the Nazis called Kristallnacht. And I relied on him for a lot of these day-to-day -day, um, cultural details. And I had this scene where Irma was going to have a flashback of when her beloved Helmut uh, proposed marriage to her. So I thought it would be cute if he tossed a coin in a fountain and made a wish that she would be his bride. So I called my friend Rolf and I asked him if throwing a coin in the fountain was a way the Germans made wishes. And he said, wait a minute, what? Uh, why is a German tossing a coin into a fountain? He, is, he said, who's throwing away money? And I said, he's just a pfennig, a penny. He's tossing in a penny. Do you Germans do that to make a wish? And he said, listen to me. If you have a scene where you have a character throw in a coin into a fountain, the next scene better be six Germans jumping into that fountain and tackling him for that penny, for that pfennig. Oh, my God. And then I also, um, this is one of my favorite stories. It's a rabbit hole story that actually involves a rabbit. In chapter two, Hilda walks into her home and she smells that her mother is making Hassenpfeffer, which is a braised hare stew. And I wrote the scene and then I thought later, you know what? It's April. Are they really going to be eating such a hearty meal in April? So I called a food historian, which who knew this existed, and I asked her if this was possible. And she said, well, yes, we would eat stew in April, but where is she going to find a rabbit when everybody knows that rabbit season ends in December? So I said, OK, well, these are not these are high ranking Nazis. They don't have to follow the normal rules. They can hunt whenever they want. And she said, right. But in April, the rabbits are just going to be coming out of hibernation season and they're going to be skinny, not plump and juicy like you want for a rabbit stew. So I thought I, I really loved that part of the research. And I will say this to anyone who's thinking about doing a historical novel, you had better be super interested in every single little detail about that period because you're going to learn a lot more than you ever bargained for. I love it. I love those details. Those make my day. The coin thing. Oh my God. I mean, it just makes it so real. Um, I, I think we have time for like one more question. Okay. Um, so after hearing you talk about all of these amazing research stories, I kind of selfishly as a fellow writer who gets stuck in research rabbit holes. Um, no, I want to know all your research secrets. So how yep. does how does research fit into your writing process? And this is the selfish question. How do you know when it's time to stop versus when like something really exciting might be just around the corner? Well, I have an obsessive compulsive disorder, which actually comes in quite handy for um, historical fiction research because I don't stop until I have the answer or I am or I know that there is no answer. So I will tell you my approach is probably the least efficient way of researching. I just stop writing and then I dig into whatever question that I have. And I did a panel recently with uh, um, Kate Quinn, the uh, historical novelist who is wonderful. And she says, that she smartly stops and when she says like um so and so wore a dress and then she writes described dress i do the opposite i stop and then i look into um exactly what were the fashions in modern shall magazine in november 1939 
Um, so an example of this is in my very first chapter when Gundy is in the doctor's office and she's having her head measured by calipers by this Nazi doctor. And she notices that she, he's wearing a, a National Socialist pin. So I didn't wanna just say it was a pin. I wanted to really describe it. So I stopped and I wanted to, and I found out, you know, was it a pin with a red circle around the rim or a gold circle? Did, were they using the Imperial Eagle turned at profile at this point? What exactly did that enamel pin look like? Well, Eden, at the end of the night, <laughs> clock struck 12 and I had written three sentences. However, I could write a dissertation in the evolution of the Nazi pin from 1923 to 1945. So I don't know that you should take my research. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not a fast way of doing things, but but it's my way, so it works. But and you then, wrote you wrote an amazing book, and it really comes to life with all of these details and the research that you did. Um, really amazing everybody should go out and buy this book like you are going to love it. it it sounds it sounds like it should be heavy but it is not heavy it's somehow it's just perfect it's perfectly toned i loved it and thank you for answering my questions i've been dying to hear the answers to all these for so long thank you so much i really enjoyed talking to you likewise I get to come back <laughs> and answer my own questions of eden which i cannot wait to ask you questions about yours because it is so awesomely different than what Jen and I have done. <laughs> and, and oh my goodness, thank goodness for you and your humor and oh, all that. So before we get into that though, I do have to share very quickly that on that note um, about research with Jen is that I remember distinctly writing my debut novel, Letters from Home and delving into World War II for the first time and, and researching until like two in the morning when I had my servicemen writing uh, a letter in a foxhole in, I think it was in, in Belgium. And he is writing, I thought, oh my gosh, what kind of pen did, did he have? Like, did they have ballpoint pens? Did it was ink? Was it like, I have no idea about pens. When did they come from? Like, how, how did they get started? You know, aside from, from all like Shakespeare. So I ended up going down the rabbit hole until like two in the morning, fascinating stuff, <laughs> learning about the history of pens. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so great. And I finally put it in. And then I think that it, I told a book club this once, you know, about, oh, yeah, the research and how we go down these rabbit holes. And I think it was one of them that lover and hater said, um, didn't you just want to give him a pencil? <laughs> Classic. And I'm like, you know what? Nobody wants to hear from you. Nobody. Nobody, <laughs> Nobody appreciates me and my research. <laughs> It's always those lines that get cut at the end of the book. Totally. You know, like, mm -hmm. But I'm a phone a friend now. I am a phone a friend. OK. All right, girl, let's talk about your book. All so right. I know you mentioned, of course, the show that a lot of people enjoy, and you're going to have some similarity comparisons there. So given your novel's premise, no doubt you've heard and you will continue to hear, and I'm wondering how you feel about that, um, the comparison to The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Now, obviously, I will say that I know that it differs in many facets, and I would love to hear you share with people how it differs and then and also how you feel about that comparison is it a good thing or does it get a little bit wearing so funny story um i didn't know anything about this show when i wrote this book i know that seems crazy but here's what happened i literally finished writing the rough draft and then i was like i'm gonna celebrate by watching this show i've never heard of and know nothing about called the marvelous mrs Maisel. and i sat down on the couch and i lost it I was like, you have got to be kidding me that this show about a young Jewish woman doing stand-up comedy in the 1950s exists, and so does my book, and how did I not know this? Whatever. So once I got over myself, I realized, um, first of all, it's actually a very flattering comparison. It's a great show. Um, and I actually love Jewish representation in the mainstream. I'm Jewish myself, um, especially when it's not strictly about Jewish trauma, which you see a lot of. So I'm grateful for that. Um, and, and frankly, it makes really descriptive, nice shorthand for when I'm describing my book. <laughs> so I feel okay about it. Um, it does have a lot of differences though. So one of the big differences actually between my book and both yours and Jennifer's is that mine is uh, an alternate history that I made up. Uh, it's not real. 
Um, basically, the idea is that when men went off to war, male comedians also went off to war and women took over stand up comedy and stand up comedy became this like all female thing. And it had this heyday of creativity and there's magic. And when the book uh, takes place is kind of as that era is waning. So like that excitement and that creativity and that magic is kind of on its way out. Um, so the the female comedians in the book have a particular kind of magic called a showstopper, which I think we're going to talk about also. Um, and it was because of this sort of exciting moment where they had this opportunity to be on stage that that magic was made possible. Um, the other thing that was really important to me, and I and it's not I don't want to I don't want to call out Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, but I think a lot of books and movies and TV do this in general which is that you never really see how the creative process works. You see somebody's a newbie and then suddenly they're an expert or like at best you get a montage with like Eye of the Tiger, you know. It was really important to me to show how difficult it is to learn how to do something creative and how rewarding it can be and how much of a community event it can be. Um, I really, really wanted to depict that as realistically as I could. And then finally, uh, the other big difference, I think, is that at its core, like I said earlier, when Franny stands up is a is a funny book about trauma, uh, personal intergenerational, you'll see a lot of that intertwined with the comedy, I think it's sort of inextricable. Um, so that's one of the other big differences. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to touch on like everything you just talked about. So, so let's talk about showstopper. So why don't you explain to them what the showstopper is, because you're going to describe it better than I can. Sure. Uh, showstopper is a kind of literal magic that comedians have, female comedians have, that elicit a particular sensation in their entire audience when they laugh. Now, the showstopper is not changeable. It is inextricable with the kind of person that you are, the things you've experienced in your life, um, and you discover it more than you craft it. Like, you can craft your set, but you can't craft your showstopper. It just emerges if you are courageous in facing your life and and who you really are yeah absolutely now i will say speaking of reviews since we're not supposed to read them but whatever whatever so we do <laughs> we do we do and oh it's so wonderful you know when you come across one that touches you so i know for a fact because i've read your reviews and they are of course all glowing which is not surprising um there was one that i read that that i absolutely had to read this line now because um this this goes to the topic of topics actually in your, in your story so what the gentleman wrote was the book is steeped in concepts that we have names for but the characters do not and i thought that was brilliant and um and that really, I thought, encapsulated some of the topics that you touch on that are not just lighthearted comedy. So you've got PTSD, um, you've got gender dysphoria, sexual politics, domestic violence. I mean, like you said, a, a funny story about serious things. So, so why don't you talk a little bit about those? Did did you plan to set out? Did you set out to cover some of those? Did they come across or uh, come out, just evolve gradually without planning? Yeah, it was a little bit of both. So, you know, trauma for so many people who experience it is is unspeakable. You know, it's it's it, it is it, most people don't have words for processing it. And comedy at its best is an art form that gives a voice to the unspeakable. And so for me, it just seemed like a natural mix. So I started out with some things that I really wanted to talk about. Um, I wanted to talk about Judaism and anti-Semitism. I wanted to talk about like sexual identity and gender identity. And some of the other stuff just kind of came, came out of exploring this mix of humor and trauma. Um, it's also an extremely Jewish trait to make humor out of horrible things. Uh, it's kind of just my, how I think. Um, and it's, I almost take it as a challenge, like, okay, this is so horrible. And how can I do this in a, in a way that is um, thoughtful, but also uh, make humor out of it. And some of the stuff like the gender identity and the sexual identity are just ways for me to explore the messy boundaries of my own experiences. Um, because like, even though in the 20th century, 20, this is not the 20th century, this is the 21st century, we do have more words than the characters do in the story. Um, it doesn't mean that those words are adequate. And so in a way, it was oddly helpful to me to explore those identities 
without relying on those words. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it was just a few months ago, and I remember this stuck with me as my son is, my oldest one is hilarious. He has very witty, dry sense of humor, very adultish humor. And so in high school, in middle school, he had to sort of dummy it down. And, and I remember we were talking about the fact I saw a comedian online on Twitter and somebody had said, you know, like, I think somebody was getting attacked for making a joke that they thought you can't joke about that topic, you know, like whatever it was. And they said, that's, that's off the off limits. And I remember a comedian chimed in and said, in my opinion, nothing is off limits if you make it funny. If it's if it's not funny, then it fails, you know. And I thought that was really interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way before. So on the topic of the process, like you talked, like you mentioned. So what was that like since you do get to explore that, which we really don't get to see very often, a behind the scenes mm -hmm. of what it takes to be a comedian that has to put together a tight five minute set and hopefully, you know, slay and kill and, and make everybody laugh. So what sure. was that like? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I, I just wanted to make a real quick comment on your, on your, the, the thing about the uh, Twitter. It, it's, it's a tricky thing because humor is, is very personal. And so I think that we're in a really interesting moment right now as we're trying to negotiate what is okay and who has the voice and who gets to decide what's funny. Um, and yeah, it's an interesting and, and perilous time um, to be in. And, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, yeah, I don't have any, I don't have any firm conclusions about it, but it is interesting to watch. Um, but yeah, so illustrating a realistic creative process was super, super important to me. I think there are so many misconceptions about what goes into, for example, writing a book, um, doing a stand up set. I actually took a stand up comedy class for women in Chicago. Uh, called Femcom, and it was taught by a terrific comedian named Alex Kumin, K-U-M-I-N. You should go find her. She is hilarious. She just recently left us uh, in Chicago and moved to New York. Anyway, she was a terrific teacher, a terrific comedian. And I guess what's the things that struck me about stand-up comedy is that stand-up writing is so much more precise than novels. It's not just the particular word. It's also like the rhythm of the word, the rhythm of the word in the moment um you know how it fits in with everything else like i was i spent so much more time and effort writing those five minutes than i've ever spent on something so short in my life like it was so grueling but like really really rewarding um then the other difference i would say is that stand up you get immediate feedback <laughs> like good or bad there is no hiding from what people think of what you did um, yeah. And that is kind of an amazing art form. And I'm also super grateful that we don't have that with novels. <laughs> Great. You get the, the live reviews. <laughs> oh my God. Live, live in the moment reviews. No, thank Take you. Take them or leave them. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Oh, so yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for answering that. And thank I you. Can now move on to Q and A's if, if anybody has questions out there. Yes. Oh my gosh. I could just listen to you guys talk to each other all night long. I have a feeling we just barely scratched the surface of all the amazing things you guys have to share. And I know that um, we have people with questions. So uh, let's start with this question from Kimberly for each of you. What book did you love most as a kid? And did it inspire any part of your writing today? That's a good question. It's a really good question. Not me. I'll hop in on that one because I'm sure the next question I won't have, I'll need time to think. So um, this one, I would say two come to mind. One is The Giving Tree. And I find it, I had no idea there was like controversy around the book of love it or hate it um, until just a couple of years ago. And and going back and reading it as a parent, I think is such a different perspective that I, I, I find that fascinating. And so I still love it for that reason. Um, and the other one that I, I remember just becoming a lover of reading was the school library and reading, um, are you there? God, it's me, Margaret. And, and that whole just coming of age girl, my age, you know, all of that was just so fun. So those are the two I remember. And did it, does it affect my writing now? I don't know. You know, that is, I'm going to be pondering at that now. That's such a good question. I've never been asked that before, but I'm sure with storytelling, you know, I think that just gets into our bones um, from the beginning unconsciously. So, so I'm sure it does in some form, but I'll have to think about it. I'm going to jump in because uh, Christina mentioned the Judy Bloom book. And I'm, I, when this question was posed, the first 
response that came to mind was Blubber by Judy Bloom. And she kind of, then I read everything that Judy Bloom wrote. And I just remember thinking like, wow, how does this grown up know all about our kid world? And, um, and, um, and how are these things okay to talk about? So it, and did it influence my writing? I'd say everything, um, everything does in, in some small way. Um, my favorite book as a kid continues to be my favorite book to this day, which is The Never Ending Story. And don't tell me it's the movie because the book is, is twice as long as the movie. And if you can find a hardcover copy, it is printed in red and green ink and it has beautiful illustrations. Um, but the story is, is this wonderful mix of fantasy and, and reality and humor and, and, and drama. Um, and it really is like every time I read it, I get something else out of it. And it absolutely 100% influenced my writing because of this hybrid of weird and and normal and funny and sad. It's it is it has guided everything that I do, I think. Love that. Okay, every time that theme song comes on that you cannot deny, that just makes my heart flutter. Oh, yeah. like, oh. I used to play that on the piano. <laughs> Oh, I just love it. It brings you right back to childhood. It's beautiful. Oh my gosh, I have to read that. Okay. So Christina, here's a question for you from Donna. Can you comment a little more on M1, MI9? Um, many of us are familiar with MI5 and 6 from James Bond. What distinguishes 9 and what made it the fit for your character? For sure. Um, great question. So yeah, MI being military intelligence section nine and what the reason why, okay, well, first of all, a little bit more about it that makes it different from the others. Um, they, number one, had the, the gadget department. So they were the escape and evade, you know, department. They were the section that helped create all of these inventions that Ironically, some in parliament actually felt it was ungentlemanly. They kind of looked down on the toys that they created because they felt it was, it wasn't fair play, you know, which is so funny. It's war. Um, to put them in care packages that were from um, fictional uh, charities that they would create even letterhead you know, called like the Travelers Association, which I thought was <laughs> very daring um, and used addresses from bombed out buildings from the Blitz. And so they felt that was sort of unfair play. However, this group kind of broke all of the rules in that way and thought outside the box. So they created all of those inventions that not only helped allied POWs escape, also downed airmen in occupied zones. So it was in, every, you know, the, the silk maps were sewn into their uniforms. They had hollow heels. Um, they would have boots that you could cut away the top part of the boot and the bottom shoe would become a civilian shoe. So your military boot would not give you away. Um, they were just brilliant stuff that they created. So they did not only that, and those devices also were sent to resistance fighters um, and also spies that were SOE and OSS and that were dropped into occupied territory had a lot of these gadgets on them to, to help them as well. So aside from that, they also had a whole other department that was even more secretive in MI9 that was in charge of interrogations and even, which didn't come out till many, I'm sure decades later, it was highly classified that they on the Wilton Park estate outside of London where they had HQ for MI9, they also had sort of bunkers there that were holding supposedly high ranking German officials as POWs there. And they would even microphone, um, like kind of mic up, tap their, their cells. And so they learned a lot from them, just letting them sit and talk to each other all day. So that's some of what MI9 did. Wow, fascinating, fascinating, fascinating stuff. And Donna wants to know, Jennifer, can you comment on what motivated to you to write this particular piece of the Third Reich story? Um, it takes special courage to immerse, immerse oneself in such a dark subject matter. How did you manage the process? Well, um, thank you. I. I, I, you know, it, it's a dark period, but the Lebensborn, when I learned about the Lebensborn program, what I was really curious about was the women and why, why would a woman volunteer to have sex with a stranger in order to have a child for Hitler? And that's what they called it, a child for Hitler. So I had no intention of writing a historical novel. I just wanted to read one and I couldn't find 
a, a novel that would answer all of my questions and tell me about the women involved. So I decided to, um, to write the book that I wanted to read with a book club. That's incredible. Just and how did I manage incredible. the process? You know, sometimes some days better than others. I imagine so. I imagine so. And Eden, Donna would like, she has a question for you. You've written so many various forms. Um, how is your experience as a novelist different from your short story essay uh, writing? Do you have a favorite form to write and is one easier than the other? Uh, they're all hard. <laughs> and the fun part is they're all hard in different ways. Um, I, I like to read novels the best. And so I like to write them the best. Like that's my, my one true love since I was, since I could read. Um, so I would say, despite how difficult they are, I, I really enjoy writing them the most. Short stories are, um, it's funny. I started writing short stories, started out writing short stories. And, uh, that skill does not at all translate into novels. Like it is a completely, they're both fiction but it's a completely different skill. Novels are very precise. They have to have a very kind of tight arc um, and there's not a lot of wiggle room to, to do it well. There are people who are amazing short story writers and I am not one of them, but it's still fun. Um, essays, I kind of came into late um, and sort of kicking and screaming. Um, I also, I host a reading series in Chicago called Tuesday Funk, which is sadly on hiatus because of the pandemic. But I started writing short, uh, short essays to read out loud um, about my life. And I really sort of got into doing that. And then I fell in with these marine biologists who took me to the bottom of the ocean in the Alvin submersible. And, uh, you know, I just got to write about some other cool stuff. So novels, um, you kind of, or the way I do it, I kind of write into it, figuring out what I'm trying to say. And essays, you start with everything you already know, and then you have to kind of find the meaning in it. It's a, it's a different cutting process, but I like them all. Excellent, excellent. And this is for everybody. Um, do any of you consider or have you considered writing nonfiction versus fiction? And if so, what brought you to that decision? Um, I'll, I'll start since I, I have. <laughs> Um, the, the, I have, yeah, I would, um, I prefer essays like personal essays that have some element of like research in them. And I would definitely do more of that. Uh, it's, it's a time consuming, despite how short they are, it's a time consuming process. So I think I would have to like take a while and really focus on that, but I would love to write like a, a book of essays, linked essays, something like that. Probably not anything more researchy than that though. Love it. Anyone else? Um, I wrote a travel memoir called We'll Always Have Paris, which followed my daughter and I through Europe, uh, 12, 12 cities in Europe. And um, in many ways, it was easier because I was there. It was now. I know what we said. I know what we saw. What was harder was, um, wow, I did not know I would be mining this territory with my I guess I had some unresolved issues with my father that came up through this uh, book and I remember when I delivered it to Shana um, she said huh this is not the book that we were expecting but we like it very much uh, because my father I just have to explain in the first chapter like why I felt compelled to take my daughter on these trips and then well wouldn't you know my father was half of the book which is just so like him um and and um so so I'm sorry what was the question I I, I so have we ever done it yes I have the differences um, you, yeah and do you prefer it Boy, they're both difficult in different ways. Writing a memoir was like five years of psychotherapy. And in that way, it was hard and it was great. Um, writing historical fiction was extremely rewarding. I feel at the risk of sounding ex extremely corny, um, I just feel really mission driven by this. I feel like I have to get this story about the Lebensborn and this untold chapter of history out. And I feel so um, privileged to be the one to do it, that it's hard, but it is just so worth it. I love it. Well, unfortunately, I'm afraid that is all the time we have tonight. 
thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I hope if you enjoyed what you heard here, that you will go to one of the indie bookstores listed on Eventbrite and buy a copy of each of these authors' books. And when you do so, you will get swag and a signed book plate. And I want to announce tonight's raffle winner is Renee Wilson. And we'll be reaching out to you for more details on that. Um, our next event will be on October 25th, featuring Claire McIntosh, Eric LaSalle, and Ashley Winstead. Um, three great thriller books and thrills and chills for Halloween. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. These books are just incredible. I'm sure all of you are dying to get your hands on them. Pre-order them, order them, and we'll see you back here next month. Authors, thank you so much. This has been absolutely incredible and informative and fascinating evening. So thanks, everyone, and have a great night. Thank Good night. you. Good night. Good night.